Good. Um, so good afternoon to everyone. It is my pleasure to uh, welcome all of you to this first edition in a row of uh, summer webinars on topics related to wearable robots and especially to this first edition on educational uh, wearable robots. My name is Jan Veneman and I'm chairing a so-called cost action on wearable robots. Uh, cost stands for uh, collaboration in science and technology. And this is a, a program funded by the European Union, fostering research collaboration across Europe and across the world. And normally, we would organize activities uh, such as expert meetings, workshops, exchange be uh, between research labs, training schools, and other networking activities. Uh, but this last year, as you can imagine, because of the pandemic, uh, it has been very challenging to organize such activities. And therefore, I'm very happy that we initiate now this series of summer webinars um, as an activity uh, supported by this, uh, by this cost action and also organized among others for the participants of the cost action. But cost action is an open action and, and everyone's welcome to attend it. And also I'm very happy that we collaborate on this with the Eurobench Consortium, especially Diego Torricelli uh, from CSIC that is coordinating this project and with income who also supports uh, uh, setting up these webinars in, in, the, in the technical sense. So a few words on the cost action. Uh, our cost action wearable robots aims to address a wide range of aspects relevant to wearable robots. For example, uh, underlying scientific issues, human motor control topics, also key technologies and tools that are of importance in designing uh, such wearable robots, looking at different application domains, medical, occupational use, and uh, look at the uh, important characteristics in these domains. Also, uh, we have a focus on ethical, legal and societal aspects of the technology, and also on the educational uh, challenges uh, in the wearable robots field. Uh, in the action, these topics are considered by different working groups and the themes of the action are also reflected in this webinar series. Um, I would leave it with that. If you are interested, you can check out our website. The link is also in the announcements and the invitation of this uh, series. Um, yeah, and last but not least, of course, I would like to thank very much our speakers of today uh, for their uh, contributions. And with that, I would like to pass the word uh, to Diego Torricelli. Thank you, Jan, and thank you everybody for staying here. So the speakers, this is a, a joint action between uh, this uh, cost action and also this uh, Eurobench project, which is a European project whose main aim is to uh, developing tools to prepare the ro wearable robots community to uh, prepare for uh, for real applications using a benchmarking as the main tool. Uh, we are preparing uh, testing facilities. There will be one in Madrid for wearable robots that will soon host uh, more than 20 different uh, teams that will bring their wearable robots to test uh, different aspects of performance. And also we are developing a, a, a software, a benchmarking software that can be used by anyone in any part of the world to run tests uh, evaluating performance of the, of, of the system. So for us, it's very important that uh, all the people involved in the wearable robots, not only development, but also uh, end users uh, can be involved uh, in this action. And that's why this uh, transdisciplinary aspect is for us uh, a key. And uh, that's why we are collaborating with COST, which, are, which is touching all these uh, different areas. And uh, that's why each of these webinar will be focused on a different part. Um, without uh, talking much further about this uh, Eurobench project, you can address uh, in, the, in its website. I can write this uh, in the in the chat. I will leave the floor to the uh, three speaker, actually four speaker. One, uh, uh, the last will be more a, a dissemination from Edwin, and uh, and I will present each of them. Mm, some logistics before uh, before starting. Uh, the talks will be around 20 minutes. 
please, if you have any question, write the, the question in the chat because we will go uh, the three uh, talks in a row and then we will have uh, uh, 20 to 30 minutes of uh, roundtable in which we can then address all the questions. Um, one uh, topic, uh, if, if, you need, if you need something that uh, I can attest uh, that you are here, you can give a certificate of your participation uh, that you can use. And uh, as Jan said, this session has been, is being recorded, so uh, uh, you agree in this by participating in this meeting. So without uh, uh, any further delay, uh, I'm very happy to um, to introduce the first speaker, which is Ebru Kilic Bebek, which is uh, 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 an experienced educator. So you know that this uh, first topic is educational wearable robots. So uh, she is an, an an educator. She has uh, a, a long experience in this field. Uh, she obtained a PhD in urban education by uh, Cleveland State University with specialization in learning and development. Then from 2012 and 2015, she was a researcher working uh, uh, for the education reform in Turkey. And, uh, and, uh, and she's still working in uh, Ozijin University. And uh, she will uh, uh, talk uh, about uh, her, uh, her uh, uh, her trajectory, but also uh, most mostly on this uh, new European project called WICORD, called the Wearable and Collaborative Robots, and uh, whose aim is to uh, improve and make uh, modernize the professional education in the field of robotics and make it more relevant to the users, uh, to the market, and to the industry needs, if I well understood the project. So, uh, thank you, Ebro, for participating, and the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Diego. Let me start. Can you see my slide? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, yes, I will today. I will be talking about our uh, project. Um, I will briefly start with an introduction to the importance of variable and collaborative robots, the scope of this project. Um, the annual rob uh, annual World Robotics Report of the International Federation of Robotics provides a descriptive framework and a roadmap for robotics in Europe. This report highlights uh, market expectations and key technology targets, such as increased cooperation with humans, including physical cooperation, and specific actuation technologies for variable robotics for manufacturing and healthcare domains. The development of such robots faces multiple complex issues with many disciplinary and technology targets involved. Dealing with them requires not only a high level of disciplinary knowledge, but also an ability to absorb and synthesize knowledge from other disciplines and a general competency regarding continuously acquiring new skills. The VCORD project I'll be talking about today aims to address the need to produce the highly skilled graduates the industry needs. VCORD stands for the Open Educational Resources on enabling technologies in variable and collaborative robotics. It's an Erasmus Plus consortium between four countries, among four countries, Turkey, Belgium, Netherlands, and Russia. It can be defined as a transdisciplinary student-centered education focusing on user-centered design with open educational resources. I would like to briefly explain what we mean by transdisciplinarity. Simply put, when different disciplines just come together, we call that multidisciplinary. When people from these different backgrounds start to synthesize their knowledge and start speaking a common language, things get interdisciplinary. However, for transdisciplinarity to occur, this synthesis must be applied to a real world problem by involving people from outside of the university, such as industry and other stakeholders 
from various backgrounds. Therefore, VCORD Consortium also involves an industry partner who provides students with real problems and industry's perspective on the issues involved. The labor market and industry also needs some boost in the skills and employability of all students. This need arises from a global problem called the skills gap, which means the university's supply of knowledge and skills does not meet the demand of the market. Therefore, one of the key aims of VCORT is to fill the skills gap in the field of robotics. It also aims to offer a continued support for professionals in the field via open educational resources and partnerships with industry stakeholders. Now, I would like to explain our educational efforts with a concrete example, which is the winter school we held this year. This winter school was organized and hosted by Erzien University. It was a five-day program, very intense, short program for two course credits. Students were provided with an industry problem to solve. The, pro the program was full of interactive lectures uh, given by invited speakers from around the world. The students were also from various countries, depending on English as the common language. They were put in eight multidisciplinary teams to work on their solution. Our transdisciplinary student-centered and user-centered design-oriented learning process involved these features. Attending interactive lectures of prominent figures in wearable and collaborative robotics, following instructions on learning and teamwork, trying to solve a real case, a use case problem provided by our industry partner from manufacturing sector, working in multidisciplinary teams of engineers, industrial designers, and physiotherapists, consulting faculty members via Q&A sessions, getting their feedback, and elaborating on these as a team, and finally, presenting a proposed solution. As you can imagine, this process was largely collaborative than individual, which was deliberate, as one of the goals here was to improve students' teamwork skills. Now, I would like to highlight uh, one of our significant findings in this program, Winter School. In this Winter School, we wanted to assess students' transdisciplinary knowledge and skills, both before and after the program. For this, we developed a survey with open-ended questions, and we asked students to fill it out. We also had a control group formed by students who did not participate in the program. All answers were scored blindly by us, and then the pre, post, and control response scores were compared. Team's final presentations were also evaluated by a jury of judges, which was another measure of students' transdisciplinary knowledge and skills. The results we got were interesting. Uh, first of all, we saw a slight uh, increase in the post responses mean, which was higher than the control group's responses, which is good news. Also, uh, largest knowledge gains were seen in the physiotherapist, which was interesting, that makes sense. Um, another interesting finding is that students' industrial design, medical, ethics and standards, effective teamwork, and self-regulated learning scores increased. Another good news. Teams successfully presented their solutions at the end of the winter school, and here is their score distributions to the knowledge area. As you can see, teams' performances showed some variability. This can be a result of their team dynamics and the backgrounds of the team members. We randomly assigned students to the team, but some of them turned out to have huge advantages based on their backgrounds and experience. And here is their mean score distributions across the knowledge areas. This chart confirms the previous finding that students' industrial design knowledge was more impressive at the end of the school. This is very interesting and shows the success of industrial design students and faculty members involved in the school because there were only four students and two faculty members from this area. Same was true for physiotherapists. 
and they came second in their success to teach others what they know. And sadly, industry, well, here, as you can see in the chart, clearly needed more involvement in the process so that students' scores could be higher in that area. Um, just to state our limitation in that sense, um, our industry representative could have been provided with a more structured and deliberate interaction with the students. I feel like he felt a bit alone and lost in the process, which was very academic, and that is our bad. Uh, there also was a, a clear language problem uh, which should have been addressed before the school started. I also would like to report something interesting we figured out during the process. We, we realized that faculty members were happier with the team presentations than students' individual responses to the survey questions. Uh, the results of the survey and the team presentations are not really comparable data, but uh, both were rated on a five-point scale. So we can check the difference based on that factor only. Uh, here you can see each team's presentation scored in gray, which is mostly higher. Uh, the blues and oranges are team members' pre- and post-response means to the open-ended survey questions. So we can say that on a five-point scale, faculty members were happier with the team's presentation. To me, this reminds the expression, the whole being larger than the sum of its parts. And this might be our next research question for our uh, summer and winter schools to come. Also, asking students to solve a specific problem rather than asking them to imagine a vague situation might have helped them perform better. In conclusion, we can say that even a five-day program helps students increase their transdisciplinary knowledge and skills. For that to happen, a real industry problem is needed. And teaching students effective teamwork and learning strategies helps with multidisciplinary teamwork. And physiotherapists and industry representatives need more support for their involvement and interaction in such educational programs. Um, finally, I would like to mention the names of the faculty members who worked in these analysis and data collection. Uh, Barka Nurlu, Özkan Bebek, Ramazan Ünal, Zeynep Karapars, Kostas Nizamis and Mark Flutters. I would like to thank them all. And this is my presentation. These are my references. I guess we will take questions later. I thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Ebru. So uh, the, the, the audience is, uh, is invited to, to write uh, their question in the chat, specifying who speaker is this question addressed uh, to and thank you for staying in time so we have more time than uh, them for the other speaker and the and the, and, and, and the question at the end so the second speaker let me introduce uh, levi argro so levi is a world uh, class recognized uh, researchers uh, he has a phd in electrical engineering he is currently the director and scientific chair of the Center for Bionic Medicine at the Shirley Ability Lab, so a uh, former Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, and also associate professor in Northwestern University. And uh, the major goal of, of his research is to develop um, clinically usable and realizable myoelectric control system and uh, specifically addressed to persons with limb loss, so uh, mostly based on, on, on prosthesis. He also co-founded a company, which is Coapt, uh, which is a, a commercializing control algorithm for prosthetic and orthotics. And today he will talk about this concept of, of open source hardware, which, uh, which is uh, more and more uh, really appealing for the community to really uh, improve and boost the process of uh, uh, advanced uh, mechatronic system uh, for the end user. So please, Levi, the, the floor is yours. So thank you. I, I hope you can hear me well and, and see my my slides. Um, yes. So the, the the title of my talk is uh, open source hardware, and I'm going to particularly focus on open source uh, prosthetic or or bionic legs. 
Um, and as was mentioned, I, I do have a disclosure to make. I have a financial interest in a company called Coapt. It really is related more towards upper limb prosthetics, and it doesn't have much to do with this presentation. But any work that I do for this company is uh, managed under a conflict of interest management plan. So the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, um, it's, it's basically the new Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. It's in downtown, um, downtown Chicago, just across the, the park from the previous location. Um, and so this was founded in 2017, and, and it's kind of a, a research hospital, has patient care, um, and many floors of research as well. So the Center for Bionic Medicine, we're located on the 11th floor. Um, we have around 63 people in our group, um, a few investigators, postdoctoral fellows, um, several PhD and, and master students. And then we have a clinical staff of prosthetists, orthotists, physical therapists, um, surgeons. We have technical staff of, of engineers, computer scientists, um, and, and operational staff of writers and business support managers, et cetera. So a fairly large team working in our in our group. And so the philosophy that we, we take here is having um, a holistic approach towards developing componentry. And so this requires, you know, engineers and scientists um, and therapists interacting with users to try to make, um, decipher what they're trying to tell us to make changes to different devices to make them perform better for the user. So this would be a typical setup of what we might use. And this isn't the open source hardware that I'm going to be speaking about. It's just an example of one of the components that, that we're designing. Um, in our group, we do device design, um, build our own devices, device evaluation. Um, so evaluate other devices. We develop some surgical techniques um, wearable sensing, control system development, and machine learning. And so I'm going to be speaking mostly about device design, control system development, and a little bit of machine learning and data science as it relates to um, this open source leg idea. So kind of where we started with this is, is there have been a number of different really advanced and well-engineered um, powered prosthetic legs that have been um, in the research domain. So we've used several of them and written several publications, but there's a high barrier of entry to doing this type of work. So you either have to build a device, which is, is no small feat, or partner with someone else who have all, how, has already built a device um, in order to do your research and development. So we've partnered with most of these groups. Um, so Michael Goldfarb at Vanderbilt, we've in the past, we've partnered with you here. We've partnered with Bobby Gregg, um, several different groups who are developing these devices. And then we're, we're more focused on de designing the control system, to be frank. Um, but along the way, we've had to do some device development in order to get ourselves there. And so I'm going to speak about this open source leg project. So this project is being led by Elliot Rouse. Um, we started working on this several years ago, maybe 2013 or 2014, we started to, to come up with this idea to do an open source design. Um, and uh, there's a lot of information on this website called theopensourceleg.com. So I'd encourage you to, to check it out. Um, since we started the project, we've had several different partners that have, have joined. Um, so Elliot's now at, at Michigan. Um, we have a company called Defy that that originally started working with us. They made the actuators. Um, and since we've partnered with several groups uh, around the world uh, to, to kind of work on this device. Um, technical specifications of the device, it's a, it's a reasonably well-engineered, it's a well-engineered device. Um, it's not meant to be a device that you could, could provide someone with as a, as a daily use prosthesis that they could use at home without supervision. It's more designed to be a device that a technically competent research and development group could build and assemble and then do some experiments in a, in a safe way without too many constraints in a lab. So I wouldn't say that this would ever be something we would target to send home to use every day. It is something that we do use every day in the lab um, to evaluate control systems, to learn clinical fitting paradigms and things like that. So you can see the, the, the parameters of both the knee and the ankle, the technical specifications. Again, all of this information is on the website. And so I'd encourage you to, to check it out. 
Um, in terms of cost, uh, again, where there's a step-by-step -step recipe on how you can make and assemble this, this device. And these are the, the vendors that we've used to construct the devices that, that we have. Um, so there's a substantial machining component. We get them done in Star Prototype. They're a Chinese machining company. Um, if you have a machine shop associated with your university or company, um, you could you can do this machining yourselves. There's nothing that's um, really really tight tolerance. Um, we get the actuators from a company called Defy. And then most of the other components or are lower cost um, with perhaps the exception of a load cell, which we get from SRI instruments. Um, that's a, a bit more, it's around $3,000 for the load cell. But again, you know, it doesn't break the bank in order for you to build one of these devices to start testing. And it's much cheaper than if you had to go through the design process yourself. So we control it. Um, using Raspberry Pi if you want to, or on another embedded system, whatever you prefer. It, it is compatible with a Raspberry Pi. Um, and you can, um, using the sensors that are available and control approaches that you want to, to do, you can, you know, you, even though it's a stiff actuator, you can control it pretty well. So this is a Ritz cracker. Um, the, the student is has programmed it kind of to in a get out of the way mode so that he can, um, push push the uh, the knee actuator along with simply using a wrist cracker. We use impedance control, and so we basically model each joint as a mass spring damper system. So we program virtual stiffnesses and, and equilibrium um, positions and damping factors um, to make it behave kind of springy. So this is the way that that we and most others um, in the past have used to control these prosthetic legs. So again, there are there's a Raspberry Pi um, example on how you can set this up and program it using, using this program that allowed us to do this um, experiment. So again, if you follow the recipe that's on the website, um, thanks to the hard work of the, the researchers on the team, specifically Elliot Rouse and his team at the University of Michigan, you're able to to get up and do these types of um, experiments or pretty quickly. Um, obviously, there's safety concerns and you have to take it slow the first time, but um, it's re relatively easy for anyone with a with a mechatronics background. And um, if you're willing to put a little investment in, even if you didn't have a mechatronics background, you could probably still get there. So we basically use all of the sensors that are available on the device. So it has a sensorized knee and ankle. We have a load cell, there's an inertial measurement unit in there, and we often use um, EMG signals as well um, from the residual limb. But if you look at the, the type of um, sensor readings that you'll get for different activities, you can see that you have pretty distinct um, sensor signatures for each type of activity, and they, they vary by the type of sensor as you would expect. Um, we're only showing the, the vertical component of the load cell, but it is a six degree of freedom load cell if you want all of the, the various um, kinetics associated with it. And so what we've done is we've used this device to, to look at high level control um, systems. So intent recognition, trying to figure out what activity the person is intending to do. And then we use that to supervise a, a lower level state machine, which actually generates the, the kinematics um, and kinetics that, that a person would need to walk with. So again, we use a finite state machine. We um, subdivide each phase of gate into subcomponents. And then we have transitions that, that um, kind of move the person around the state machine. And again, this state machine has also been published in work that Annie Simon out of our group um, has, I think it was in plus one, to look at all of the various impedance parameters that you might need to restore these types of, of walking. And then Aaron Young, who used to be with our group, um, was able down at the University of Georgia to, to put those same impedance parameters in a device down there with, with only minor changes and have someone up and walking pretty quick. Um, we also use a, a phone-based app, so a key fob, um, in order to do collect training data so we can supervise the, the activity that the person is operating in by using a phone-based key fob. What we're really trying to do is use sensor 
readings that are available from the device um, and then predict the upcoming activity um, using machine learning algorithms. So this is the Vanderbilt leg. Um, this isn't the open source leg, but this is the, the type of movement that we were working with. This video is from around 2013, demonstrating the capabilities of what you can do with a, um, with a device that's programmed properly like this. And I'll show in a few slides what, what it looks like when implemented on the open source leg, um, just for comparison purposes. But he's able to walk, um, sit to stand transitions. And in this particular case, we have EMG signals that are feeding into the control system. So he's able to reposition his knee and ankle just by, by thinking about making the movements. Um, we quantify our performance in terms of errors. So how many steps out of, a out of 100 um, would be improperly predicted? And you'll see our control system, you know, in 2013 wasn't perfect. It's still not perfect, although it's much better now. So depending on the style of high level control system, you know, you might get something like five steps and a hundred that might have a mistake associated with it. Um, often the users, if you're using an impedance control paradigm, don't notice the mistakes. So you're predicting spring and damper uh, values essentially. And so if your stiffness isn't quite right, the person can still walk. It maybe just feels um, feels like they're walking in a hole or it's not as springy as they might like them. There are some situations where you get the um, impedance parameters wrong and it does have catastrophic um, consequences, which I'll, you'll see in just a moment. But generally speaking, people, if there's a misclassification, the report is, I don't like the way it feels. I don't feel confident ambulating on this control system, but I don't think it necessarily would have caused me to fall. Um, and so transitioning between the activities is particularly difficult. So it missed a transition from stair descent to walking, and it felt like he was walking in a hole. And this is a, a dangerous mistake where he was going down the stairs and the control system, in fact, predicted he was going up the stairs and the, the leg wasn't in a position to allow him to ambulate properly. We've been able to correct most of those mistakes. This is the same control system implemented on the open source leg. Um, again, it's a, it's a produced video, uh, but it just shows the, the quality of ambulation that you might expect um, from, from a user walking on this device. So again, you can restore the same, same quality of ambulation using this open source device. Um, again, it's not designed to go home with someone, but in the laboratory, you can do untethered um, walking experiments without much problem after you have the control system configured. Uh, we take it out of our lab into the hospital and under the supervision of our, our team, we can walk around the surrounding um, community, but we, we would never send this home as a daily use prosthesis, even though we've taken it into his home. So now, you know, if you build two of these devices, um, sky's the limit, right? So you have a state machine. If you configure the state machine properly, um, there's, there's no reason why you can't control two devices at the same time. There's no reason why you can't control two devices to walk upstairs. This is, of course, done right now with, a, with an able-bodied adapter. Um, this afternoon or tomorrow morning, they're actually going to try this with a patient. So you basically can, can roll your own state machine, change the parameters that you want, um, and restore all different types of activities. So a problem, um, not a problem, a challenge is in considering, is in, um, constructing the state machines that allow for this um, ambulation to be, to be restored. And so what we've been working on now is removing the state machine and just using deep learning to map the sensor data from the device to the motor currents that the person wants to use using a deep neural network. So we have examples of this device that's been configured for something like 50 people. So we know what the sensor data is and we know what the the motor currents should be. So we just use a deep network and we map the sensor data directly onto to the motor current. And in fact, you can restore ambulation that way. So the complexity of designing a state machine, um, and we, we do intend to make our data um, open source. Um, we haven't yet, but we're gonna put it in a repository so that anyone can, they can develop their own deep learning approach and see if they can, in fact, do the same thing we're doing, and they can develop a better deep learning approach, which I'm sure they can. Um, we have very talented scientists working with us, but um, 
there are many, many other approaches that could work equally well or perhaps better. So again, no state machine required. This is just the user um, walking on the, the device. And again, this is new, newer research, but this is a guy, again, walking up the stairs using a similar device. Um, we've even did one recently where we, we trained a new user who had never participated in any experiments to, to just get up and go walking on these devices because their kinematics are, are similar enough um, and the task is similar enough to what, what we require so that the deep network just generalizes. So that's where we're going in our research using this device. But the main point is that this is a capable device that allows you to do this type of research um, and, and get you up and, and walking um, in a reasonable amount of time. And so with that, um, I just want, you know, there's a ton of information on the website. Uh, Elliot and his team have done a great job there. So for more information, more technical specifications, more tutorials, I'd refer you to that. Um, and then after, if anyone needs additional information, I'm happy to, to answer them in the, in, the, um, in the question period after. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Levi, for this uh, very inspiring talk. Tons of questions, <laughs> I have to wait. Uh, so let's uh, switch directly to the third speaker, which is Volker Bartenbach. Which is the he was the CEO of the of the company Aux Evo AG, which is from Switzerland. So Volker uh, was uh, uh, working uh, from 2010 to 2012 uh, at the KIT uh, in Germany, uh, working on humanoid robotics and optic interfaces. Then he switched to 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 Zurich to ATH on the sensory joined the sensory motor system lab. And then uh, five years later, so in 2017, he founded Beyond Robotics, another company, so before Exivo, that was uh, uh, specifically focused on, the, on commercializing educational exoskeleton. And then after this, um, a couple of years uh, ago, he co-founded this uh, Oxivo company, where he still continues to work on exoskeleton and also to educational exoskeleton. Um, uh, Volke also won recently the, the Eurobench award to go to the facility, to the Madrid facility, to, to use the benchmarking uh, uh, the test beds and, and software to, to, to test uh, uh, their exoskeleton functionality. And the title of the talk would be Wearable Exoskeleton Robots Filled with the Humans. Please. So thank you, Diego. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. And thank you, everyone, for the interest in these talks. Uh, again, my name is Volker Bartenbach. Diego already introduced myself, so I can skip the first slide. Very briefly said, I came from robotics, um, basically worked there as a student, became a researcher, did my PhD in the field of exoskeletons. And at some point, I then not completely left research, but then ventured to um, to actually uh, commercialize this technology and bring it to the market, uh, which we are now doing basically at this company, Oxywoggy, which is a, a manufacturer of mostly industrial exoskeletons, but we are also involved in developing educational exoskeletons. And this is what I will uh, show you more about actually today. Uh, just a little bit more about myself uh, on the same slide, basically a little bit more colorful. Um, my, my own personal story in robotics started already as a student working in the field of humanoid robotics or robots that interact with the human. When I then moved on for the PhD, I then got um, involved in the exoskeleton development. So this is kind of the uh, next level where we basically have the robot inside of the human and have to make this work. And uh, conducted a lot of basic research there, was also more involved in medical products or in medical developments there. So exoskeletons for people with some kind of uh, physical impairment. And now since 2017, basically we are now developing um, exoskeletons mostly for industrial applications. So this means mainly for workers who are executing physically very demanding tasks every day. And we offer our exoskeletons um, to prevent high workload and injuries. 
my own story is quite well linked with the story of the company Oxivo. Um, what we do now is based on all the research that we have done at ETH in the field of exoskeletons. Again, we then transitioned step by step in the context of a transfer project from 2017 to 2019 and incorporated the company then in 2019 and where we have now two industrial exoskeletons on the market. Very briefly where we are today. Um, you see our two systems in the upper left corner. So it's a lift support device and a carry support device. Um, in the other, in the next picture next to it, you can see our educational system. So we have two educational exoskeletons on the market. Um, what we do, we do all our research and development ourselves. So at Oxivo, what we have, we have one, uh, of course, all the engineering capabilities that we need to develop these devices. And what is also very important um, that we have a biomechanic labs in-house so that we can measure the effect that our devices have on the human user, which is very critical if we develop exoskeletons that are supposed to support this human user. And as you can see on the right hand side, our devices are as of now um, used across many different industry worldwide. Um, you can see it here, logistics, warehousing, airport uh, logistics, construction companies. And my very favorite use case you can see in the lower right corner. This is basically a blacksmith shoeing a horse and while doing so he uses one of our exoskeletons to reduce the high load on his back. So this was a, this was a very fun day. With that being said, so these are mainly our, um, our, our industrial exoskeletons. But again, we are also developing educational exoskeletons. And of course, this is the main topic of today. At the moment, we have two systems. Um, the one is the educational exoskeleton EduExo. This has been available for a couple of years now on the left hand side. And what we are now doing, we are developing a little bit more of an advanced version of an educational exoskeleton. We call it EduExo Pro uh, on the right hand side, which is at the moment still being developed. And I will show you a little bit more details about this in a, just in a moment. Um, you might ask yourself why an industrial exoskeleton company is doing educational exoskeletons. But I think the motivation is uh, very, very clear um, because exoskeletons themselves are still quite unknown. And we and we see this on a daily basis that, you know, if you leave academia, you find so many people who do not know about what exoskeletons are or based on science fiction movies and, and, and books, they have slightly wrong impressions of what exoskeletons could be. So for us, this kind of educational outreach is an important part of just promoting the technology, um, communicating, educating what exoskeletons are, what they are not, what are the possibilities and what are the limitations of this kind of technology. And for that, we are offering these kind of do-it-yourself kits. The original motivation to develop this kind of educational kit is actually, but is actually a little bit older. And the idea for the kit was born like several years ago already when I was, was still doing my PhD at ETH. And in one semester, um, there we had a, like a project group um, or a, a project for students where the task was for a group of 10 students to basically build a gate support exoskeleton that eventually can support a paraplegic user. So here on the right hand side, you can actually see uh, with the final prototype of this project. And the experience we had back then was that uh, while we only had two, uh, 10 places in this class, because also limited, limited by the fact that the hardware is comparatively expensive, uh, what we had when we posted the project, we had more than 100 students applying for this project. And it was very obvious that the interest in doing this kind of project was very high. So with this experience, we basically ask ourselves, OK, how can we for the future make this kind of project available to more users and to more students and not just to this limited number? And what we decided back then, OK, if you want to achieve that, we have to make exoskeleton technology more affordable and more available. And keeping in mind that we want to offer it actually to students, more affordable really means it should be hundreds of dollars not 10,000s what you usually pay for the for the uh, professional systems, but also for educational systems. And available in our context meant, OK, we should try to make it accessible to people even outside of university context. 
So ideally, people who are interested in that should be able to do something like that at home or with friends or maybe also in a classroom. And with this with this idea in mind, we then basically thought about, okay, how can we how can we offer something like that? And the answer was was the answer we found was already there basically because this is not a new idea, but in robotics you will find many of these educational robotics kits or simply robotics kits. And these kits do basically exactly that. They offer you with hardware, they offer you with a manual, and when you assemble them, you basically learn how you do it, how you do, uh, how you develop a robot. You learn about, you learn the skills, you learn the programming, you learn the mechanics, and so on. And what these kits also do, if you take a look, is basically the educational version of these kits typically resembles real-world professional robotic systems. So you have your articulated robots, you have your mobile robots, you have your humanoid robots. And what we saw also back then is, I mean, this is basically very simply a gap that we have to close if we want to achieve our goal. We have to offer this kind of system, but just for exoskeletons. What we also wondered ourselves, of course, when we started designing this ki these kits was, okay, what makes exoskeletons actually so interesting? So why did we have so many students applying for our class? Because in parallel, there were also a mobile robotics class and there was also a, a drone class. So there were different projects that could, uh, students could apply for, but we had a very high number of students applying, especially uh, specifically for the exoskeleton project. And we very simply asked the students who applied and the answer was um, almost in all students all the same. They, they, they found it very interesting that it's not only about robotics, but it's about the combination of a robot and a human. And this, this combination is, is fascinating. This combination is interesting. So because it's also challenging, so it's not easy to develop a good exoskeleton. But, but there are so many ways how you can interface the human with the robot, how you can you know, exchange information, how you can exchange support and uh, provide provide support for, for the human. And this combination of human and, and exoskeleton, if done right, you really have the best of the two worlds. But if you do it wrong, then the human user inside might really suffer. So there's a lot of to take in, but this makes it, it's difficult, it's not easy, but it's also, this is also what makes it fascinating. And when we, and when we break it down to what it means, uh, learning about robotic exoskeleton, it basically, means that you can learn about many different disciplines. So you have the things that make robotics already so interesting. So the combination of mechanics, electronics and programming, which probably all of us finds just fascinating. And then you basically have on the inside, you have the human with anatomical topics, with biological topics, with medical topics that you can discuss. And if you want to integrate an exoskeleton into your, uh, into your classroom, into your classes, then you can basically also decide a little bit, you know, what is the most important part? What do you want to highlight and what you rather want to address on the side? And this offers many people also with many different backgrounds um, to be interested in this kind of topic. And we have seen it uh, from the students applying to the project back at ETH that the, the, the students who applied for this exoskeleton project were a comparatively balanced group uh, between male and females, but also between computer scientists, engineers, movement scientists um, that were interested in this kind of project. So they really came from all different fields and backgrounds. With that in mind, we eventually developed these kits and you can again see them here. You can see the one on the left hand side and the right hand side, they have both the same idea. So you will have you have a box inside of the box. You find many different parts and you find a handbook. And the idea of both of these kits is basically that it is a kind of an all, all inclusive robotics kit. So if you have the box, if you have the handbook and if you had the hardware, you can start right away. So you are not really dependent on uh, additional information. So you are not dependent on additional hardware. Um, so you can do it basically at home. It was also important for us that the handbook covers enough theory that you understand why you're doing it. So it's also quite extensive and that you have the chance that you apply this knowledge then also immediately with the hardware so that you also get this kind of hands on experience, which especially in the case of variable robotics um, is very important that you 
that you do not just learn about why you do it, but you really feel how it's done. That if you tune your control system, as we have seen also in the previous talk, if you change them, uh, change your control system, how it feels, how it how it changes, how the, the, the system interacts with you, so that you have this kind of um, experience as well. What we also were aiming for, and this is again true for both exoskeletons, is that the hardware contains features that you also will find in professional exoskeletons. So the idea is if you assemble an educational exoskeleton, then you should learn skills that you can apply later in your career if you are working on professional exoskeletons. And this is, of course, not always easy, especially if you want to keep the price really down as low as possible. And just to give you a rough number, so the system on the left hand side is between two and three hundred dollars and the system on the right hand side will be around a thousand two hundred dollars once it's on the market. So you have to, to you have to, of course, balance how much money you spend can spend on the components to make it interesting enough to be a, a learning platform, but you keep it affordable enough that a student or at least a school or university can actually buy them or several of them. And this actually, I think we found a good solution. So we still have, you know, we can still create four sensors in there, for example. I mean, they're of course not the most accurate systems, but they, they work, so they show the principle. Um, you have an amplifier chip instead of an amplifier. You have a, a low cost EMG sensor in there. So again, the signal will not be the best in the world, but it's sufficiently good to show the idea behind it. The control, for example, is done on an Arduino microcontroller open source systems that you will find a lot of information easily. And, and, and this is basically the idea that we can really make it affordable, but have features in there that you will really find in professional exoskeletons. The handbook itself, and there's a little bit of a difference between the EduExo and the professional EduExo, uh, consists of a couple of up to 10 chapters. So we cover the different topics that are relevant for exoskeleton developments. So we start with topics like anatomy and mechanical star, uh, topics. We also teach some mechanical design, electronics and software engineering. Of course, control system engineering is quite important, um, especially the control systems that are used in this kind of exoskeleton systems. And in the ninth chapter, this is usually quite interesting for students. So we have a virtual reality or video game chapters. So you will learn how you connect your exoskeleton uh, with a video game to play it. This is, for example, something that, that is done in a professional rehabilitation exoskeletons, and this can also be replicated with the EduExo. And now in the last chapter of the new EduExo, we basically have a couple of scientific experiments that once you have built your exoskeleton, once you have programmed it, once it's actually working, that you can experiment a little bit with it and test how much it can support you and test how much more endurance you have with the system. Just to give you a better idea, I mean, the handbook is basically, again, it should teach you everything you need. So we have theoretical um, explanations in there, how the things work. And usually the most chapters consist of two parts. You have the first part is typically the background and the theoretical information. And the second part of each chapter is then a tutorial that guides you through the assembly steps, that guides you through the uh, soldering step. And it also, for example, provides you source code listings that give you a guideline or an idea how you can program the system. Another thing was, of course, that is kind of important, again, with the same motivation that you can use it at home or in classrooms, is that you do not need many tools or software, especially not uh, expensive equipment. So the tools that you basically require for both exoskeletons is <clears throat> uh, that you need a computer system for the programming and for the video game things, a soldering system and a couple of screwdrivers. Uh, for the software that you need to implement all the tutorials, you basically need the Arduino software, a Unity 3D game engine, and the Autodesk Fusion uh, CAD program. And the important part was that we used systems there that are, or at least there's a free educational version available, and that are again, nevertheless, still interesting, and you learn enough uh, that you can also transfer it to a prof professional environment. The target audience that we are aiming at with this EduExo is listed here. So I think we, we aim certainly at students at a college and high school level who are interested in this kind of stuff. Uh, we also have a lot of interest from just the maker and hobbyist community who are simply doing this kind of uh, project for fun. 
And last but not least, we certainly have educators at a high school and university level using our systems in their classrooms. Um, and they use it basically as a starting point for their own um, for their own programs, for their own courses, for their own labs, which is quite easily doable. Again, they of course they have advanced technical skills and they can modify these systems as uh, however they like. So they can also adjust it to their local setups and use it within their, uh, for example, with their own data acquisition uh, software. These target users are also reflected in the use cases that we have seen um, over the last years. Again, the, the first EduExo was launched in 2017 by now. So it has been used in classrooms. It has been used in extracurricular curricular activities, for example, robotics labs. And from time to time, we always see that we have the private user who is just interested to learn about the stuff and basically doing it at home in, in his or her free time. One thing is, is also quite interesting that we have seen over the last couple of years that they use that users are using our systems as kind of a starting point for their own project. So they take it far beyond what we are actually basically describing in the handbook. Um, on the left, you can see uh, basically a complete redesign of the uh, of the original educational exoskeleton by a group of engineering students. Um, in the middle, we have uh, have seen a nice project of how it has been used in a university lab to set up a classroom, uh, set up a class. Uh, which was aiming more for experimental work. And on the right hand side, this was quite an interesting project where a master student uh, used it um, to build an assistive device for a wheelchair user. Of course, the master student, she was she was basically building an educational exoskeleton, learning this, uh, learning the learning what she can learn with it, and then disassembling, reusing the components and, and building something completely different. But this was also really nice to see how they transfer these the skills they learned to completely new projects. Um, maybe you wonder yourself why we offer these two systems or why we plan to offer these two systems now. So again, the educational exoskeleton here on the right side, the first one, here, the idea was really keep it as affordable as somehow possible while still not losing money. Um, and we certainly achieved that one. It was also quite well received. But what we also have received over the last couple of years, more or less frequently, was interest in a little bit more of a powerful system. So while the, the people really appreciated uh, the content of the book, they just said, OK, it would be nice if we had a little bit more powerful hardware, which makes the entire project, how we use it, for example, in classrooms or at the university, makes it a little bit more exciting, also interesting for students. And this is basically what we are now aiming to do with this advanced version. You can see it here on the left hand side. And I think the difference in hardware is more than obvious, so I do not have to describe that. Um, what we're really trying to do is now build these systems, develop the system, and I have two videos to share with you. So the first one that you see what kind of hardware it is. So basically we have a two degree of freedom shoulder joint. So you can rotate your shoulder joint freely. And if then we have a spring in, included there so that we can gravity compensate um, the support of your arm so we can help lift the arm. Uh, this spring can adju be adjusted. And last but not least, we have an actuator in the, in the elbow joint demonstrated here which then can actively support the user or the user's elbow movement. Um, another example I like quite a lot is, uh, this is an example about the control system chapters. So you can see here we do EMG based control. So the user is basically, we have a sensor on the biceps of the user here. The sensor is then detecting if, the, if there's a load on the muscles, on the muscle simplified speaking, and then the exoskeleton detects this load, activates the motor, and then basically provides the level of support needed. Again, this is something that you will build yourself with the system. So if there's some error in there, you might need to find it yourself. There are some, a couple of more examples on that on our YouTube channel in case you are interested on that one. And now it's playing again. Um, and now actually a very lucky coincidence um, is that uh, if you ask about the uh, availability of this system, um, we basically what we have developed now is a prototype, um, a fully functional prototype. But what we have started just three hours ago, we basically launched a Kickstarter campaign to 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 promote the system to see if there is enough interest in such kind of system that justifies the development for us. 
Again, this is not these are not systems that we earn a lot of money with. But basically, what we need him to be is they they have to. Um, they, it has to make sense that we finalize the development, and if this is successful, um, we will launch this system um, towards the end of this year. And in order to really make it available to uh, yeah users at home, but especially researchers and universities who can use this as a comparatively affordable system. Again, this will cost on the market, it will cost around 1,200 US dollar roughly, or 1,000 euros. Um, yeah, to build, use it to set up their own classes, maybe they can use it in research, maybe they can modify it for their own purposes, just to have the starting point basically for educational and research project um, available. So with that being said, I am at the end of my talk now. So thank you very much for your interest. And again, if you have any more uh, any more questions, please feel free to contact me or us in this regard. Thank you very much, Oke, and uh, say very interesting, inspiring, and also timely considering your Kickstarter now action. Um, so I've seen some question arising in the in the chat. And so before going to them, I uh, will leave the floor to uh, Edwin van Asendolk, which he, who is organizing this summer school on wearable robots, or also in the in the framework of cost action. So just uh, some minutes for him to advertise this uh, upcoming event. Yes, thank you, uh, Diego. Just let me put up my presentation, which should be there now, right? Can you yes. see it? OK, perfect. OK, yeah, thanks. Uh, as uh, Diego already said, uh, we are going to organize a summer school on wearable robotics later this year here in September. Uh, actually, this is the third school that we are uh, organizing uh, yeah, together with uh, Jan Babic, Etienne Berdet and uh, Christina Bayon uh, within this uh, cost uh, framework. So the initial school, schools were actually winter schools, um, but uh, yeah, the corona situation unfortunately didn't allow us to organize it uh, uh, last January. Um, and uh, we, yeah, we so we actually decided to uh, organize a summer school instead this year. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, the good thing about uh, organizing this winter school has been that, like, uh, we managed to really bring together lots of people, uh, especially PG students and postdocs from 14 different countries, mainly from Europe, but also from China and Canada and the United States. And uh, we actually got them. Uh, to work together on mini projects and also just really have a uh, fun time together. So I think uh, the, 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 yeah, the thing that this winter school was also uh, yeah, built around some skiing activities really uh, made that students uh, got to know each other and also really uh, got, yeah, actually performed some networking activities, so to say. So this year it will be a bit different, uh, but also uh, the same, so uh, same, same, but different. So we still have lectures in the morning from some uh, great uh, scientists uh, and uh, people from companies. Uh, so uh, yeah, the, the um, confirmed speakers are on the left. So we don't specifically focus on, on a particular topic, but we try to uh, cover wearable robotics in a broad sense. So uh, going from some ergonomics to performing simulations to assess the effects of uh, exoskeletons to um, talking about uh, <coughs> yeah, the, the design, the control, um, uh, sensory restoration, uh, all these different aspects. Um, so that will be in the morning. Uh, then in the afternoon, we will have uh, mini projects uh, where the students will work in groups. I think that's also a bit similar as the setup as uh, Abu had. Like, I think it's important in these kind of schools that students work uh, together on some concrete projects to also really get some uh, hands-on experience. And then uh, in the afternoon or in the uh, evening, we will also, instead of some having some sports, summer uh, winter sport activities, we will now have some summer sport activities. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, as said, we also think uh, that these mini projects are essential. So we will have 10 different mini projects where students can choose from uh, and they, yeah, like they differ, uh, but they either cover like some uh, interaction control. So try to uh, control a device, uh, evaluate or like perform a biomechanical evaluation of a certain device or having uh, or set up some uh, algorithms to uh, to perform intention detection and I think the cool thing here or at least the special thing uh, is that like this year we will also closely collaborate with the Eurobench facilities um, so the summer school will be held in uh, Van der Kane Canyas Island which is uh, very close to Madrid so it's two hours from Madrid but we will start the first day in Madrid at the Eurobench facilities uh, and we will also have some projects uh, in which we will be um, yeah, evaluating uh, device, devices or passive back support, for instance, using the facilities uh, that are available uh, from or at the Eurobench facilities. So um, if you are a PG student or a postdoc uh, or like if you are a supervisor of uh, them, uh, please uh, let them know that they can apply for this school. Uh, you can apply till July 10th uh, by just sending your CV and your motivation letter uh, yeah, uh, via this website. So you can uh, find all uh, required information there. Uh, because Cost Action is supporting this uh, summer school, we can also really keep the registration fee quite low. So it's only 500 euros, including everything. So accommodation, food, uh, whatever you want to do. So um, that's pretty much what I wanted to say. So um, yeah, please uh, spread the word and uh, or register if you are interested. Thank you, Edwin. I think this is a, a wonderful opportunity for these schools. I think uh, they are exactly uh, they fill in the topic of uh, today's talk. And uh, I would say that uh, now we have uh, at least 20 minutes for questions and discussions. Uh, and Jan Meneman will chair this, uh, this, this space. Yes. Uh, thanks for the very nice presentations. I think that really were a nice focus on, on two points of, of educational aspects, especially what kind of hardware can we use to really let students work on something and confront them, let's say, with the, the reality, with robotics and wearable robots. And the other thing is the importance of the, the different disciplines uh, like yeah, what we could call inter, multi or transdisciplinary aspects uh, where the importance is that people with different backgrounds uh, collaborate uh, to, let's say, in the design or development of this kind of system. I, I've read all the, the questions that were put in the chat, but I would like to start with the questions that focus a bit on these uh, bigger topics of, of ed, uh, wearable robot education. And I would then say that also all the speakers then could react to, to the topic, even though the question was addressed to maybe one single presenter. So the first uh, was triggered, it was a question from Javad Masood to Ebru, but that triggered the question uh, on the industrial involvement in this training school, but I would say in general in this kind of multidisciplinary uh, uh, projects and how we could uh, yeah, do you have any recommendations or ideas on how we could improve uh, this industrial focus or relevance or input to, to this kind of educational uh, effort? So, yeah, Ebru, you can answer yeah. that first, but okay. if others want, then want to react, that's also fine. Okay. Um, well, when we look at the, well, both sides, industry and uni universities, have a shared common interest in this thing. Uh, from university perspective, university need real world knowledge for their students, like projects, real cases to solve and work on. And industry uh, needs to keep up with the innovation and global competition. So there's a shared interest. I'm feeling like there needs to be some budgets allocated from both sides, maybe some collaboration going on uh, to put in the, into these educational programs, summer schools, winter schools, whatever. 
And it doesn't need to be too long, as we have seen in our case. Just a five-day, really intense hackathon type program would work really well if structured nicely. Um, nice tools we have seen today can be a very nice uh, way to um, go through this smoothly, maybe. Um, I don't know, competitions, maybe, or that if, if there can be some nice, um, prestigious reward in the end, like an internship of opportunity or a project-based involvement in an R&D of a company, something like that, students will be very willing uh, to, to join those because in our case, we gave them course credits, so they got great, so they were rewarded. Uh, so we need to come up with a way to encourage participation from a student side and also from university and industry side. Everybody should benefit from it. And to me, it sounds like for industry, we need to solve their problems. First, we need to understand what, what problems they're having, and then see if there can be a match between institutions, higher education institutions, to work on the solution. Thanks. Are there other speakers that want to react to that? Or in general, to the topic of how we could involve, or do we need to involve industry in this kind of educational I guess in in the United States, from that perspective, the National Science Foundation funds um, they they place a high emphasis on broader impacts, including ed education. But they also fund um, industrial research through small business innovative research programs and small business technology translation research programs. So those are opportunities where industry is encouraged to apply, and they often partner with. Um, with an academic organization to, to do a subcomponent of the work. Um, I think it's important that uh, everyone, people recognize that industry and academic institutions have different priorities. For example, regulatory and safety for the industry, is, depending on the application, can be emphasized. Whereas for the educational side of it, maybe a working knowledge is important, but getting deep into the weeds um, isn't necessary. And I think that kind of scares each other off to some extent of, well, what you're doing isn't done under a quality system, so it's going to be difficult to take the industry, whereas that's really not the underlying focus of that aspect of the work. So just having clear expectations, I think, is also helpful. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, like I, I, I totally agree. So just a very short comment on this. So uh, for the winter school and also for the summer school, we always at least try to get some person from industry. So that has been Otterbach. And this year, hopefully we will get some from uh, someone from Wondercraft. And indeed, like uh, as Levi already uh, mentioned, it's just also very important for students to really consider what what uh, what makes yeah what is important in industry right that they just not only think about a nice product but also regulatory affairs need to be done and what makes it eventually that a project uh, gets to the market but also gets uh, yeah successful right so uh, and all these kind of things i think are very important for students to consider and to understand that yeah that it, not just a, a fun good working project always makes it to the market right that there's way more to it yeah, I just want to sign up on that, um, being on the dark side myself uh, now. Um, it's, I, I mean, it certainly doesn't need to exclude each other. And we have uh, student projects here in the company as well all the time. And I think it's uh, really profiting from that they see what we are working on basically towards the customer side. And we see what's going on in research. That's mutually beneficial. Thanks. Then, then I want to continue with the question that I thing came from Diego um, and was addressed to Fo uh, Volker in the first place. But I think it's an interesting question because he asked, like, if we think about this uh, multidisciplinary uh, need of, of having people of different backgrounds around it, so not only engineers. So how suitable is this type of hardware also for people with less technical background to interact with and, and yeah, can they understand it, use it, improve it? Or, yeah. How do you see it in mm -hmm. that aspect? I mean, what I can say now, what we have in our own team, not a student team, but our pro professional team, I mean, we now have engineers and uh, movement scientists working hand in hand. 
And this works extremely well. Um, so, of course, the movement scientists would not be able to optimize the control parameters or, um, or, or, or basically write the code for it. But I think, you know, they, 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 they understand what the system should do for the user. And even if they might not, and this is kind of a motivational, and, and please excuse the crying baby in the background. Um, that's uh, so. This is really this is really helpful. I mean, this helps the this helps the engineering uh, engineers understanding, but also the movement scientists that we have. They are they understand the technology well enough to to really provide valuable inputs, and not just any vague rough ideas. So at the beginning, it might take a little bit of time to get used to understand what the technology the technology can really do, and especially what are the limitations. But if you have some exposure to the uh, to the to the technology, to the hardware, and especially if I mean, the, the, it's very often that the first time you have used it, then you will be much better suitable to understand what it's doing. I mean, again, if if the if the movement scientist will become a developer eventually, maybe not. It might also not be the best case to do it. But I think they all understand enough to actually appreciate and use the hardware. Yes, thanks. Uh, maybe make a link to to the open source lag there. Uh, of course, yeah, that is. I, I think that it, they almost speak different languages. Everyone's speaking English in our group, but the te technical um, group speaks highly technical language. The clinical group speaks about movement and what they want it to do, and then the patient doesn't understand either one of those terms. They just want to walk, and so part of it is everyone is smart. And everyone has very valuable contributions. It takes some amount of time to, for people to learn how to communicate with each other, which I think is what uh, Volker mentioned. And after that happens, um, the team can really make um, they can really make great strides. So we're just trying to lower the barrier to allow more people. They're, they're still going to have to go through that. They're still going to have to learn how to communicate with each other, but they're going to have a, a lower barrier um, to do so. So. I, I'm not sure how to overcome it. That's just what we've observed. Thanks. Yeah, also an, an additional question primarily addressed at, at uh, the open source lag is, is uh, because this probably has not been developed as an educational tool, uh, although it is kind of suitable, at least for a research environment. Um, but how, how do you see it in the context of, of educational uh, application? Also, maybe because of the safety or potential. Well, well, if you if you take the if you don't think of it as a leg and you just think of it as actuators on on um, on lever arms, you can actually learn an awful lot on how impedance control systems work. Um, I, I didn't explain all of the aspects of it, but there's there's the option to put a series elastic actuator a spring element in series with the motor. And so you can learn about um, series elastic actuators and control. And so the some of the code tutorials on the website go into how you can do that. So if you, if you just take the patient off of it for um, uh, an engineering, mechanical engineer or, or, or anyone, they can download that code and feel what, it took me a long time when I first got started, I'm an electrical engineer, by background, it took me a long time to figure out what mechanical impedance was versus electrical impedance. And being able to just feel that when you make a programming change goes a long way to help with my understanding. And so I had a PhD by the time I was learning to do that, but it, sometimes it just takes hands-on to make it click. And so there are a lot of aspects um, that this will will do that, that will help enable that. Yeah, I think that's a nice link to to a next question. That is, how, how far are we from introducing wearable robots into educational practice? Although I would say we already see some, let's say, real examples of it. So it's also then a matter of scale and, and a matter of where is this relevant? Uh, one is, of course, specific training schools on wearable robots, but another is more uh, a standard education in, in certain academic environment. So maybe you can just openly react to this open question like, uh, yeah, how far are we away from introducing wearable robots into educational practice? Uh, 
if anyone wants to kick off on this question. It's it's very broad question, but we we, we use it all the time for edu for general education. Um, oh. In what context? Have, like, like for, for which disciplines or, or what? For prosthetics, especially. I mean, we have little kits that people can can try on to move a prosthetic arm mostly, but they can actually be in control of it. And we take that to elementary schools and high schools and, you know, museums, technical museums to, to give people hands-on experiences. We don't incorporate it into our lectures. We do incorporate it into our laboratories. Um, and so, again, it's the it's the hands-on operation. They're not. We don't have people wear our prosthetic leg, uh, for example, but they can experience many of the challenges associated with it. The, the issue that we have is that it costs so much. So I was very happy to see the third presentation on getting a kit that's um, medium medium um, cost or low cost for this application to. To assist with that because we would certainly use that to to uh, disseminate more broadly if we could maybe i can actually share a couple of numbers we have i mean we have seen it now as i told you the the, the first kit was on the market uh, since end 2017 and we offer like the boxed version um, because it's the one that you get everything in one box and then what you also offer is a digital version it's not completely for free, but uh, it is around uh, $30. So you get basically, you get the PDF handbook, you get uh, files to print them yourself. So the, the, the STL files that you can 3D print the parts and basically lists of components that you have to order if you do not own it. And 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 since 2017, so of the boxed version, we have around uh, close to a thousand now um, around the world. Um, and I would say we can split it up um, like, like it's basically balanced more or less. So we have, I would say, one third is with universities um, on all continents, almost all continents. Um, the, re the rest is basically we have some with high schools and I, I would argue 50% is with private users. Um, so using it either at home or in classrooms. And of course, the digital version, then we have additionally the, the this maker edition, what we call it. So basically you print it yourself. So we do not know what happens once we send these. Um, so typically we have seen them being used in robotics classes and we have also seen that people build kind of then for everyone in there. So I would argue it is used at a, I don't know if this is a big scale, um, I, 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 have to, I don't have an education background so I, I see it from a different angle, but I think it has been used um, on a already a little bit wider scale and also repeatedly. Again, high school level, university level and then 50% at home. So, and uh, I would argue probably half of them are students based on their email address and half of them are just makers and, and hobbyists who just enjoy it. Mm. Also, from, from my two. personal uh, observations, I would say, I've seen that, that indeed Lego Mindstorm is quite often used in an educational context. Um, not that I want to advertise that that brand or anything, but I think if you have a certain size and a certain platform, that also makes life easy. So, so do you think that that it's somehow uh, possible to to attach, uh, let's say, wearable robots to a bigger platform like Mindstorm, or I don't know if there are alternatives, or is there a specific reason why this wearable robot disciplines should be? on its own, so to say, or, or is it too different, maybe safety aspects or other topics that, uh, yeah. To me, it seems that like, uh, I didn't, like, so I, I, I of course saw like uh, Lego Mindstorms and like people have made exoskeletons in it and like all kinds of fancy stuff. Uh, but as far as I know, I had never saw like an interactive force controller in Lego Mindstorm. So I think the ability to use uh, yeah, force sensing uh, to control your device, to make it compliant and, and these kind of things is, is of course something that you don't get with the Lego Mindstorms. Um, so, but that is an essential element, I think, of the wearable robotics. Uh, controllers. So there is a limitation and of course the power of those motors. Uh, but a part of that like uh, to, to learn programming and, and these kind of things that's yeah like I think Mindstorms cannot e easily be beaten. Uh, 
uh, so to say. But the interaction control, that's missing. Well, on my side, I w um, when things get complicated in education, when the problems are too complex, I, I look at the learning of learning side because education is a system. To me, it means curriculum, training, programs, very structured path for learning. But when we just say learning, uh, to me, I think complex issues need community and collaboration. And, you know, computer science students have this huge community. They, use, they are using Stack Overflow, things like that. So I always felt like Kickstarter should have a, a community side to it as well, like putting, putting on projects, problems, and people can write and help each other maybe. That could be like a community thing for variable robots. And it would be, to me, ed educational, but not in the strict sense of the word. It will focus more on the learning, informal learning side. Yes, thank you for that addition. I think it's a good point. Yes, it comes into my mind that maybe uh, since the wearable robots is an interactive robot, you can even use this kind of uh, technology to to implement um, um, community games, no, in which there is interaction between users all around the world. And uh, because at the end, an exoskeleton can be seen uh, as an optic device, no? And uh, that really can uh, make the push forward what other types of robots cannot do because they are not uh, intrinsically uh, collaborative or not in physical contact with the user. So I would say that that could be something that is unique for wearable robots and can boost the community building, no? At all levels, no? Yes, I see that we are almost at the end of the planned slot. I know that I didn't go through all the questions, especially not those questions that are uh, asking very specifically on aspects or technical aspects of the, the presentations. Um, I would anyways encourage you to get in, in touch if possible uh, to, to clarify these things. I think I didn't ask with the presenters, yet, but Volker said it very explicitly that he's open to, to uh, any questions. I see Levi also nodding. So I That's think cool. if you have a, a specific technical question or, or very specific question about the, the open source lag, it, it, it makes sense to directly ask this question. Um, for WeCourt and also for the cost uh, training school, also there, I think if you're interested, both these projects and schools uh, uh, continue. I mean, w one summer school is around the corner, but also in record, I expect that we will hear more uh, on education and wearable robots. So, so there you can also get in touch with the consortium, with ABRU or with, um, yeah, through the website probably. or Balkan. Artu Barkan uh, in the cost action. He's also there uh, co-chairing the education work group indeed, and he's uh, connected to the record project. So I think with that, also from my side, I would like to thank uh, the presenters and also uh, the audience for the interaction and for the questions and for the interest. Uh, also, we will make this uh, session available uh, on the on the Eurobands website, and we will inform you uh, to the cost action communication channels and other channels uh, where to find it. And I would also like to uh, point you, as you could see in the announcement, that we have upcoming additional uh, editions of this webinar series on occupational exoskeletons and on medical uh, or wearable robots. Uh, I see Diego posting the next session already, and then we have a session also on, on benchmarking and, and standardization aspect. Um, so thanks again. No. Diego, I don't know, do you have the last words for today? Uh, no, thank you very much to everyone. Don't miss the next one. I don't know if it's true what I just posted, because I see that uh, 
there will maybe a shift, but let's say be uh, be be stay tuned. And uh, this was the first. I think it would be a really nice interaction. And uh, looking forward to have uh, all of you and more of you in the next uh, webinar. Thanks for the speakers, and see you soon. Have a nice day. Have a nice week. Evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.